those things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that, that, that's a strong indicator. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we're trying to make uh, we're trying to make a circle so that it's no longer spatially clear who is the panel and who is the uh, who are the audience. Why don't we get chosen? I was just going to say so I think it's spatially clear. Yeah. 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 Or we could sit on the table. I want it to yeah, be spatially unclear. <laughs> They're so bad. They're so bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so yes, all of, all of everyone who's far away over there, come closer. Come closer. It'll be warmer when we're closer together. It's changing body heat. I'm too close to the camera. Let me know. Is somebody keeping track of time? Is that somebody's job or is that my job? What, what time does it go to? I don't know. 4.45. Okay. And is somebody... Do you want me to set an alarm for 4.40 so we have to keep uh, If you could keep track of time, uh, maybe give us like a 30 minute warning. Um, I think we're going to try to keep it not uh, talking and, and then questions later, but, um, but just to know like when we're 30 minutes towards the end. Uh, so hi, I'm Krista Kui, I'm the coordinator of this panel. Um, these two people are with me. Um, can you just uh, each introduce yourselves? Bojo, Solomon and Dijnikas, Jibana names and Dunjaba, Krishnabe Gukwe, my name is Brian Solomon. Um, I'm an artist. My name is Amelia, I'm the curator at Dance Makers Center for Creation, which is right over there. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'm also a choreographer and teacher, writer. Are you going to? I already introduced myself. How's it? Yeah. I'm Evan Weber, and um, I come from, I live in this place, Toronto, called Toronto. I work, um, I work, uh, I'm, a, I'm a writer and I make performance, and I work in this collective called Public Recordings mostly, but I, uh, also do some curatorial facilitation work like uh, for the past couple of years until just now I organized this residency called Hatch at Harborfront Center um, which is a, an interdisciplinary performance situation um, that's enough I feel like we should continue around the circle mm -hmm. somehow is that okay is that okay? Sure, okay. I'll go next. Okay. Uh, my name is Talison. I'm a yeah creator. Uh, I work mostly in device work and um, movement-based work, and uh, I've only kind of just recently started to use text. Um, and uh, I'm also a dramaturg and artistic associate at Canadian Stage, so that's kind of put me into the text world a lot. Um, and uh, so so I'm always interested in, yeah, uh, ways we can talk about um, movement and, and uh, yeah, visual languages that maybe aren't text related. Mm -hmm. My name is Marie Barlizo. I'm a playwright and dramaturg from Montreal. I work at Black Theatre Workshop and also at Table d'O. Um, I'm text-based, but I also actually work from my body and create text from, um, from movement. Um, I live in the New York City area. Um, I, how do I define myself? As a theater maker um, who's really interested in the dramaturgy of the body and using the body as, as a meaning making. I'm also a Feldenkrais practitioner, so I'm really curious about the connection between that. And I happen to teach writing at a state university, so how we can use the body in writing, um, any kind of writing, logo centric or not. Hello, my name is Maddie Boutita. Um, I'm an incoming third year MFA student at Mary Baldwin University's Shakespeare Performance Graduate Program in Stanton, Virginia, which is very text-based, so I'm very <laughs> interested <laughs> to implement, to see how dramaturgy and non-text-based work, like devising and working with different types of 
movement, like Feldman Christ and Suzuki and things like that could influence things in interesting ways. Do you want to say? Oh, um, my name is Alejandra. I'm a, I'm a York student. I'm a musician. I also do cranial sacral therapy, and I'm, I think I'm doing a master's at some point. I'm <laughs> 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 also your tech person. Are you allowed to join our circle, or do you have to sit over there? No, I'm charging my phone. Mm. Oh, okay. And, I, and I'm trying to. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll be right there. All right. Come just join us when you when you feel ready. I'm Talia Kingston. I'm from Wham Theatre in Lenox, Massachusetts. It's a company that intersects activism and art. And I'm mostly I'm a dramaturg, mostly text-based um, and playwright. And um, but I'm about to go into rehearsal with 13 teenage girls to devise a performance. And I've done devised work before, but it's been a while. So I'm just wanting to remember how to notate some of the thing, discoveries that they make in their bodies. Uh, my name is Lauren <laughs> Sullivan. Um, I'm a, a dramaturg in New York. Um, just graduated grad school. Um, I'm especially interested, um, as someone with a visual impairment, um, interested in, in how I can be involved in non-text-based work and devising. Um, when I when I found that um, I struggle with non-verbal communication and I'm still like discovering what what parts of non-verbal communication that I don't perceive because I don't perceive them. I'm Valerie Bauer, and I've recently just moved to Toronto and sold everything I ever had to get here and <laughs> given it up, everything I ever made or earned. But uh, my background is I was um, 25 years as a high school educator in theater and also an ice skating choreographer. And I come from three generations of ice skating and grandmothers who own studios and a mother who's still 82 laced up. But the long and the short of it is, is I want to create a play for theater on ice and I have no concept of what a notation or a vocabulary would for transferring the theater knowledge and the dance notation to ice skating to blend it somehow to create something that may have a departure point or a legacy. So I'm hoping some beginnings and some inroads might happen here today. Uh, I'm Amy. I'm an Appalachian dramaturg, and my work is cited really, really heavily in language and text and storytelling and story circles and oral tradition and culture. Uh, but a recent project has me asking the question, what would an Appalachian avant-garde look like? And what tradition are we pushing back against? So uh, it's got me asking also uh, how generational and cultural knowledge is um, <coughs> cited in the body and what might be a nonverbal expression of our culture. Can you introduce yourself to us? I'm Mark Bly. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Hannah Hessel Ratner. I'm a dramaturg, theater creator, audience enricher at the Shakespeare Theater in DC, and welder, um, which is a playwrights collective. Um, but it's the name of the Playwrights Collective, The okay. Walkers. I, yeah, no, I know, I know. It's welding the play. It's still exciting. And the idea is that you can focus on one playwright's vision and create the whole structure towards what that vision is. So my piece is coming up um, this fall. And <laughs> I've done a lot of devising, and I'm very interested in work that um, decentralizes the playwright. Hello, my name is Eva Kearns. I work in Ottawa with the Canada Council for the Arts. I'm responsible um, for the playwright development centers across the country and also I run a program that funds um, professional development opportunities such as this conference. <laughs> so uh, I'm here really to stay on top of what current conversations are in um, dramaturgy, play development work, and my own <coughs> personal disciplinary background is actually in dance and devised theater. Uh, my name is Susan Bond. I'm a freelance dramaturg, a product, classical production dramaturg here in Toronto. I'm also training as a librarian, and I come from a really, really text-based background, and I'm increasingly aware of the knowledges that I don't have access to because text is privileged so heavily in my background. So interested in learning particularly about embodied knowledges. So, yeah. 
Um, Brian uh, Drader, and, uh, just coming off of 14 years of director of playwriting at the National Theatre School of Canada, which is where I am. And I uh, just moved back to my hometown of Winnipeg, uh, where I'm the uh, director of the Manitoba Association of Playwrights. And uh, in terms of dramaturgical play history, I've worked with Cirque du Soleil and also on uh, museum exhibit design, which is uh, sort of where my interest in. Uh, in this panel is in terms of expanding that text base or beyond dialogue. My name is Jess Appledown. Um, I was a dancer. I did theater. I studied performance studies. Then I got an MFA in dramaturgy. I have a theater company, One Year Lease. Movement is core, is part of the development of new work that we do. And we have a movement director there. I have uh, collaborations with set designers where I make new work with them. Uh, I work with choreographers. Um, for me, I write about devising and dance dramaturgy, um, and I am consistently wanting to remind dramaturgs that we exist in bodies, and I think <laughs> that it is imperative that we figure out different performance languages, because as we're creating and generating new work, um, we're working with people who have many different forms of performance that they're working with, and so I'm consistently figuring out and wanting to push the envelope of who we are, what we know, and what languages we speak. Uh, my name is Lo, and I live here in the District 1's Boone Territory, and I'm a settler. Um, I'm a performance artist, and um, I do um, dramaturgical thinking around my own processes. I'm very involved in creating conceptual work that involves dramaturgical processing. And um, I come actually study clown for like 20 years. I performed with uh, Pachinko Clown in Toronto. There's a tradition of Pachinko Clown, which is partly from a Native North American tradition, but also a uh, um, European clowning kind of mix. This guy, anyway, whatever. Um, but it, there was a, a big tradition in that in that um, world of self uh, self sourcing material and creating work from the body and writing on your feet and. I've um, merged it with kind of improvisational practices where I do spontaneous utterances and manipulations with objects and stuff like that. But I see myself in a visual arts context now. But um, yeah, dramaturgical thinking is like huge for me. Um, maybe I should also say who I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm Chris, I thought this was a good idea. Uh, I um, I'm originally from Toronto, but I'm based most of the year in Brussels. Um, I work uh, in an interdisciplinary fashion, kind of in, in the intersections of dance, media, art, and writing. Uh, and I work, um, a kind of overarching practice is actually as a curator. Um, and then within that, because I curate almost exclusively new works, there is a, a I typically have ongoing dramaturgical relationships um, with artists, um, both those who are working in performance and also those who are working in visual arts, which is kind of a wacky thing, because they don't do dramaturgy in visual arts. Um, so it's, yeah. Um, so, uh, so the title of the, uh, uh, so much fun over there. <laughs> um, so the, the title of the panel, I think what I submitted was There Are No Words, uh, Dramaturgy and Non-Text-Based Performances. Does that sound accurate? Okay, so just as a starting point, there's two lies in the title that I think we need to address before we go forward. Um, the first is that when we say non-text-based performance, it's actually slightly more specific than that. Um, we're talking about dance dramaturgy today. Um, we're kind of hijacking the LMDA event, <laughs> a theater-oriented space, to talk about uh, dance and art form that within the greater scheme of performance is like usually kind of kicked to the curb. Um, so we're taking over the space. Um, the second is when we say non, when we say there are no words, um, a lot of the works that we will be talking about today have words in them, <laughs> <laughs> but they are contextualized by their creators as dance. Um, the goal of today is, uh, for me, uh, not to arrive at answers, um, but to lead the session today with a series of questions, um, which we can then potentially develop into a longer one-day uh, multi-session conference on dance dramaturgy, hopefully have it at some point in, next year in Toronto. Um, so uh, again, like 
all of us have questions, I'm sure. Some of us maybe have answers, but the goal is not necessarily to come to any conclusions. It's just to kind of say, like, what, what are the things that we would need to talk about? Um, so this is a bit of a think tank session for another conference that will happen in the future. Um, if anybody wants to leave now, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> be offended. Um, so I've asked each of the panelists um, just to arrive with one or two questions that they wanted to talk about. Um, so maybe we can just kind of go in order uh, and then potentially continue around the room, tossing out questions, maybe addressing, maybe proposing answers to them, maybe not. Um, I'm going to be typing madly because I'm stealing all of this information from you. <laughs> You're all doing unpaid labor for me right now, helping me rethink what my conference is going to be. Um, do you, is that enough of a sure, starting yeah. point? Yeah? Okay. I never, in these things, usually um, prepare anything. <laughs> I just try and work um, uh, from a place that's always sourcing what's currently interesting to me. So what's been really interesting for me this past year is the notion of um, aesthetics and how um, they're just this uh, unfathomable type of um, guiding force that we're all operating within. Um, I think when it comes to, I, I actually really hate the concept of dramaturgy sometimes, especially as, um, as a dancer, I sometimes feel like it's theater colonizing dance. Um, I'm also mixed blood Anishinaabe, an Irish person, so I'm always looking at things through a pre and post colonial lens. Um, my own evolution has been um, in visual art. I come from an area, um, Jabananing, you might know it as the Killarney Provincial Park. It's um, one of the birth areas for the Eastern Woodland visual art tradition, Daphne Ojig and, and others in the Indian Group of Seven. So I started with visual art, um, went to a performing art high school in Sudbury, moved through contemporary theater in a regional setting and then found dance and fell in love with it and spent my 20s dancing um, in a contemporary way, but I'd actually call it classical in my mind for a lot of companies in Canada um, and in Europe, in Germany and England. And after a decade of abused body, I started to create my own work. And when I started to create it, it actually went back to visual art. Um, so I actually think um, almost everyone or everything is creating from a place of images. Um, which I, I think is fascinating, especially having somebody with a visual impairment in uh, the circle. Um, just because if there is any sort of language that every one of us across all the corners is speaking and everything in the world uh, that's living, it, it's, it's moving images. We can't possibly comprehend each person's language or each human language or each animal, sister and brother language, but we, uh, we're moving through a language um, of images, I believe. And those languages are, are governed by aesthetics, which um, sometimes work in our favor and often work against us. They're used um, against us. So in that way, you say visual art, there isn't a practice of dramaturgy. It's because I believe in visual art. Um, it, it's nothing but dramaturgy. Um, it's, it's embedded in what we do to make sense of things. We're constantly trying to make sense of the chaos uh, around us. I think a way um, to understand, um, I think what I'm talking about in terms of being governed by images, I'll do this really fast and I'll do it over here so that I'm not sure how close you can see, but just so you can see um, the exercise I'm gonna do. I have a... Uh, do you want to see? I know. <laughs> sit too much in our life. <laughs> I have a square and a triangle. And when I put the triangle on top of the square, what is that? It's a house. So what's it missing? A door. Okay. What else? Window. Where's the ground? It's probably here. It's probably made of grass. What else? Just keep it firing. Chimney on top. Chimney on top, indeed. What else? 
Sky. 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 Woohoo! Little sun. <laughs> Probably put some people for the for the house. Path. Sorry, what was that? A path. A path. Yes. A path. <laughs> Little little fence probably leading up to the path. Tree. Tree, definitely a tree. What type of tree? An oak tree. An oak tree? Oak maybe. Or an apple tree. I jumped the gun. So you can do this exercise across the world and you'll always end up with this. And I know where I come from, none of the houses look like this. And I'm going to guess that even in the heart of the Western world where we are, um, none of your houses looks like this. So, so where the heck does that come from? <laughs> and, and how many other um, aesthetic laws are you constantly um, struggling with? Sometimes they work in your favor. You know, the male robin has this brilliant crimson red breast to attract. The female, that's um, a favorable aesthetic um, and then there's the media overload which we were all faced with we leave here and there's a semiotic overload of signs and advertisement and all of that and that's getting used against this but when I look at um, our forms especially in dance and in theater um, and and how they just often seem to be just struggling um, really struggling to, to find ways um, to insert themselves uh, with other media forms that are in 2018. Um, they're, I think what they're actually struggling against is, is their old aesthetic rules that, um, that make no sense. Um, I'm born without a left hand, so you could imagine that was quite trying um, in, in company sort of dance um, world. And it's really funny, and, and you'll get in contemporary dance, this notion that it's incredibly progressive <laughs> because it, it thinks it's really like high art mm -hmm. dancer. Um, you know, and you will not find often somebody who's not 25 to 35 and really beautiful. Even if they're, if they're native, they're like me, they're very aesthetically white passing or they're a Halle Berry type of black. Um, and we're really governed by that in dance and we're governed by still this, this notion of it being high art and of the court. And, and theater is working with its own um, set of those things as well. There's rules. There's these rules that like nobody out there actually understands. They walk into a space and they, they have no clue. This weird set of rules that we've, we've made um, for ourselves. So I think that would be my first question to pose to everybody is it, when, you, when you're making a choice dramaturgically, is it from a place that uh, is embodied and felt, you know? Um, or is it, is it coming from a place that you've convinced yourself is actually felt, but it's thought? Mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and it's working in this, um, this aesthetic rule that you've just carried on for no reason. Um, can we talk about it? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, yeah, that's so fascinating. That idea of um, like where we want to go, like a, and as an audience and as a public, like oh, the play needs this, the story needs this, and as dramaturgs, we're always doing that. Like, or as a director, like oh, we know that that's okay. You you know you've set up this idea, and and it wants to go here, and we feel that. And sometimes that is. Um, the audience feels that too and it's like successful or whatever but um, I think there is like a big satisfaction like I think like us watching you draw that was like satisfying mm -hmm. like we felt good mm -hmm. about it um, but those moments like how to find those moments where it's uh, broken um, and and is that satisfying just for artists you know, is that a conversation just between artists when you break that? Oh. Or is it, you know, or is, can you do that in like a community context and that still be satisfying to people who haven't, you know, spent years of their life thinking about that stuff? I, it's really beautiful. It's, it's the natural next step to the question about aesthetic is when would it actually be of use to break it? Mm -hmm. um, I think 
you would position yourself in a, in a better way to just understand that that's what's going on when you're leading yourself to a place to try and tell a story. You know, because there's a whole other one I could do, right? I could go, as an indigenous person, I can go, what's this, a semicircle in two lines? It's a teepee. And what's missing from the teepee? And we'll go on a beautiful racist tangent. Um, <laughs> which is a responsibility you have as a dramaturge to not go there, or to understand when you're going there. Um, I've been in works before. Um, I, I still keep up my theater practice just as a muscle um, to, to work with. And I was in um, a play two years ago in, um, in the Tarragon, a kind of contemporary classic institution here. And I played um, a like, half-breed, homeless, delinquent. And um, I had another white, um, homeless person with me. We were playing teenagers. Why is the costume designer making my clothes dirty and hers clean? Why, um, why are, is the makeup artist putting some like makeup dirt next to my table and suggesting I put it on myself? Because it's painting the homeless indigenous narrative. And it's going to tell an easier story for the audience. They're going to get in there and they're going to get it in 30 seconds. Well, we can start to change that actively and, and you can clock when you're working within an aesthetic that's been handed to you and actively break it. And there's actually innumerable possibilities when you break um, that aesthetic. You could, you could find moments in your own life when that aesthetic has been broken. You know, maybe you're with a loved one and they're dying and it's not the way you've seen people die on TV. And it's incredibly important to feel that. Um, it can be grotesque. It can uh, do all sorts of things. Your dreams um, work outside of this aesthetic. So a real masterful artist can, can work within the aesthetic laws and tell a story and then smash it open um, and take you to a place which can transport you um, to anywhere. But that's, that's a great follow-up because what is it as a useful thing to understand you're working in this way? Yeah. And I guess it would depend on context. It's mm -hmm. like who, yeah. Who, who, who are you talking to? What are you hoping to, that they understand or that they see? Or? Yeah. I, I've been thinking about this a lot from actually a perspective of a lot of words. My husband's a poet um, and we talk a lot about audience response in terms of story or in terms of emotion, right? And I think dance can do both. Um, and theater can do both, but theater more often than not relies on narrative and story um, and wants the conclusion. And you were talking about like having a nice, a satisfying conclusion, right? That's letting everything that's like entertainment. We're gonna have a great night at the theater. Um, but there's another layer of um, audience experience that is purely emotion-based without understanding um, and thinking of like someone like Beckett who created works that were text-based but also were very physical um, and disrupted expectations. Uh, there's not really a question in that, but that's throwing this onto the table too. I mean, that's, 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 that's very interesting to me because I am, um, I've ushered, since I've been in New York, I've ushered at BAM Brooklyn Academy of Arts a lot, um, and they they bring in a lot of dance, and I've I've you know met so many audience members you know after they've seen the performance that were just so moved by it by the emotion of it and everything. But I as as someone who is visually impaired, unless I was sitting really close, I missed it completely, and so I'm I'm kind of wondering if there's because I I also when I just sometimes when I miss visual cues I can still like sense what people are thinking or feeling about what I'm saying in a conversation and so I'm especially wondering when it comes to those like dance forms when I can't get as close as I want to like how maybe how can I still access that emotion can we go to your question <laughs> questions yeah um, I'm coming from a really different way of thinking about the proposition 
question than Brian is, so my questions are going to be a little more like uh, nerdy dance, dance detail. Yeah, that's fine. Dancey. Dancey's um, fine. The first question that I that I came to was about uh, thinking about the role of dramaturgy in more formal dance practices. Um, I come from a background in, in classical ballet and in a lot of the kind of dancing that Brian was describing, and I, um, like a lot of people do, and a lot of queers do, coming out of a dance form like that, I cut off my hair and rejected it. Um, and then recently I've been coming back to it and um, looking at, yeah, really formal dance. Um, as a site of a site of power, and I've been thinking a couple in a couple ways about that. The first question that I had was, what was the role of dramaturgy in really formal dance environments? I also don't work in in formal dance forms at all. My own work isn't particularly formal, and um, although I have I have questions about it, and <laughs> Evans like making a face because he's curated a work that I don't know formalism. Um, <laughs> but my, my but the as a curator, I don't work a lot with. Um, formal dance, so I'm curious about uh, about the role of dramaturges and of dramaturgy in formal dance sites. And I, the other question that I had is more about um, responsibility and and the role of the dancer. And I'm wondering about what or what the role of the dramaturge is to dancers, or what the, resp the responsibility of dramaturges is specifically to dancers in an environment where dancers are working. Um, I, this first question, we talked about this yesterday, yeah. um, like the relationship between uh, uh, um, dramaturgs to working with classical forms. So one of the panelists who wasn't able to be here was Nova Bhattacharya, who is a choreographer who works with Bharatanatyam, uh, which is a highly codified, very rigid dance form, uh, and she works with it in a contemporary context. Um, but you're only allowed to move your body in certain ways. It's very, very restricted. So when you're working within that highly uh, limited movement palette, what does dramaturgy look like? Because actually there's only certain choices that you're allowed to, to make. Um, the same thing if you're working with the classical European tradition of ballet, you're only supposed to move your body in certain ways, so what does dramaturgy look like? Um, we don't have anybody who's speaking from that perspective. We both studied ballet at certain points in our lives, <laughs> but I, I don't know how to talk about it anymore. Um, so this is like a panel probably for the yeah. for the conference. I'm wondering not so much about codified classical dance forms and just about formalism and dance in general. Like I wonder about the role of dramaturgy in some in something like um, early TDT work or like Toronto Dance Theatre. They're a mm -hmm. modern dance kind of gram company. So any work that isn't necessarily codified in that way, where you right. don't have like only certain movements that you can do, but where it's uh, predominantly about oh my god, let's say like non-narrative, abstract, um, movement-focused, beautiful yeah. images, um, movement-focused work. Like I just saw this work in Montreal at the Festival de Transamérique called ta uh, Six by Nine by, ta by Tao Ye. They're a like, hugely successful uh, choreographer from Beijing, this like beautiful like army of identical androgynous dancers. Um, and I wonder about the role of dramaturgy in a piece in a piece like that, where for about twelve minutes a row of six dancers, these like very fluid spinal movements in quite exacting unison. So when there's when there are dramaturges in the room on works like that, I wonder about what questions are they asking and what's what's the what's the point? Are they asking questions? Um. I mean, I think I think so. Like, yeah. Or, sorry, is or is that the old, is it the only labor that they're performing? Is is asking a question, or are there other uh, actions that dramaturgs are doing um, when working on new pieces with choreographers? Yeah. Well, I don't know, and I don't I don't work in that world of of dance and choreography, um, and I. I guess then there's also this role in dance of rehearsal director um, of somebody who sort of, and this is why I ask also this question about responsibility to dancers, that a rehearsal director is somebody whose responsibility is counted to the dancers. A good rehearsal director will be like on the dancer's side and like puts the schedule together and gives the notes. Bad rehearsal directors are assholes and um, make dancers feel bad about themselves. 
but so so in a situation when there's also a dramaturge in the room, which also just to say this this imaginary situation is so rare. Like I don't know in other contexts where people are working, but I know in in Toronto in Canada there's almost never anybody else than the choreographer and like maybe their friend who they're paying fifty dollars to in the room. Um, it's, so it's it's quite unusual, but I um I, yes I'm just gonna finish my thought. Um, Yeah, I have the, I have this question about the, the I had various. A, I had a conversation with Fiona Griffiths, and she was saying maybe in Montreal that there was a quite a different system of um, dance dramaturgy. Mm -hmm. It's more prevalent than here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's they have more money. Uh, I'm just yeah. You wanted to say something? Uh, yes. Uh, a couple of years ago in uh, New York, uh, there's a, there is a woman. Her name is Kathleen Krasinski. Uh, I funded her uh, as part of the Bly Grants. Uh, she she lives in London, and she's a uh, she's a dramaturg, dramaturg, text based, but also a dance dramaturg. And uh, she actually came to New York and did a series of dance uh, clinics for us. I. You know, at my advanced age, participated in one of these, in fact, for two, three hours. And uh, with about 15 other people. And it was quite extraordinary what she did. Uh, as part of my funding of, what, of what, I did, what she did, she went over to Germany and uh, she looked at, uh, she interviewed Pina Bausch's uh, dramaturg book uh, and covered what he had done on Bandian, uh, that work of Pina Bausch, that extraordinary work. And she knew a lot about dance dramaturgy, both you know, from a non-textual uh, way and dance dramaturgy. So, and this became a book, in fact. So there's a lot out there about it. I'll uh, say, um, I, wish she would, I wish she were here. I don't know well, if you were around. I co-created the workshop with Catalan. Yes, yeah, so you so, know about this. Um, uh, and uh, have stumbled. One of the verbs that I like to use as a dance dramaturg when I'm working is that um, we're offering, we're stumbling, and we're stumbling with the process of choreography that is happening. There are different verbs that, uh, and labors that we perform. Um, questions is one portion. Um, mirroring, uh, sometimes which becomes verbal, uh, as we're showing what we're seeing, um, sometimes with language, and other times, uh, I work with um, a choreographer named Jody Oberfelder, and there are times when she'll want me to do the movement as well, and then ask, and then share the details of what that feels like. So, so I think it's always an exchange of figuring out vocabulary. Can I ask? Um, sure. What the difference between her asking you to do the movement and tell her how it feels is versus her asking the dancers what it feels like? Um, this was like a one-on-one -on -one that she was making a solo piece. Oh, I see. So, yeah, okay. so like th that was a portion of, of the dance. Okay. So, um, so, and it was just a moment of exploration there. So, um, so um, the, the workshop that we did in New York City was based on um, a woman named Mira Rafalowicz's work. Um, and she was a, a dramaturg with Joe Chaikin, um, and there's a there's a, a whole series. We tried to like accelerate what it is to create a, a dance piece from beginning to end. Um, and the primary uh, there's no answers to anything, but like the primary um, questions that we're asking dramaturgs um, is how to be in our bodies as well. Well choreography and movement is happening so that we can both take, we can both figure out notation of the choreographic and also take care and be a present and part of a dancer's relationship to new work. So, um, so yeah, so there's, um, there's a lot that's, that's present.
I guess I have a question, uh, and I'll just speak from my ex experience because uh, as somebody formerly trained in dramaturgy, and I, I ran from that term for a long time. I always wonder, um, just add this to, as an and to the conversation, why we place dramaturgy outside of us in this person, because the act of creating is an act of dramaturgy, and we are all creating our dramaturgy and is an embodied act. So I always wonder why is it out there when it's it's here, and we're all doing it, and dancers are doing it, and creators are doing it, and what happens when we shift that conversation to it being this action as opposed to this outside thing? Mm -hmm. I, I would I would actually, I, I love that you asked that because I, I believe that dramaturgy is an embodied thing yeah. and it, uh, we've gotten so far away from it yeah. that that's produced the need for for a role of, of, of the dramaturge. Like, um, it would have been so cool if Nova was here. Yeah. Because I, I also she think about it. She has a giant show of Leonardo. She's a big superstar. <laughs> 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 My mistake for inviting Because <laughs> when I look at them, um, well, even when I look at ballet and its roots, uh, like from Renaissance to post-Renaissance to like early classicism, I would omit uh, the last century. Um, it, like dramaturgy is absolutely built into what's going on because it's it's in its nature interdisciplinary, which is really funny because we and we always like every generation wants to feel like it's inventing. Something, but like we've we've become so um, I don't know what we've become in, in, in the in the advent of the digital revolution, but um, that the live arts has certainly become really bland and tamed down in some ways, and I think um, we're coming out of that with with new information from digital information. But when I look at um, when I look at my own traditions and the Shnabewin, the difference between um, when you're dancing, when you're storytelling. When you're singing, when you're drumming, is like not much at all. It's like now this is the part where we drum, and now this is the part where we weave the story into your regalia. Um, and from what I do know from um, that Ignatium, it, it's from an age where something similar was going on. It, it, it's completely um, in in itself uh, an interdisciplinary form. People train together and can either become the person who's creating the music or the person who becomes the dancing, but they're starting from the same place and storytelling is totally embedded um, in the form. And because, I don't, like, it's, it's funny, we think of those things as well as being highly regimented and my own, like, personal question, again, back to the aesthetics, is how we should look at what we're doing right now and how it's, it's regimented. I had a, a recent I'd say debate, but it was actually an argument with a friend about um, a lot of, let's say, like the top ten most popular European creators, and she was going on about how different this one was and that one, and I was like, you know what? In 20 years, all of their work is going to look the same. Um, it's going to be that period where it was so completely neutral, nothing was said, and, <laughs> and mostly naked with bright lights and clean lines. And it's like if you're, you're functioning in your own way in something that's highly regimented. Um, it can be subconscious, but that the aesthetic is so strong, um, people will not move this way in the future. You're, there's a set of rules that you're following. So maybe in that way, it, it's it's the dramaturge role to to help the creator um, relate to other forms a little bit more. Um, I just wanted to come back to the second yeah. question you had about um, dramaturgs caring for, for dancers. Um, one of the things that mm. often separates dance from theater is that theater performers usually have a union that protects them, mm. uh, that says what, how they can be treated and how they cannot be treated. And dancers usually don't have that. Um, and this question of like how the actors are treated, uh, I don't think in a theater dramaturgy setting that comes up because somebody oh, that's somebody else's responsibility yeah, to deal I with that. But in a dance setting, because that actually is usually not somebody else's job, the fact, I don't have a response to it, but it's just interesting to me that that's a question that comes forward. Yeah, um, I think there's also an issue that... So were you Oh, I was just saying that it's interesting to me that it's uh, that this is a question that uh, dramaturgs in the dance field could potentially be responsible for look, ensuring that dancers are treated properly. Or yeah, treated I guess it's it's a oh. it's less about in, is it the dramaturge's role to ensure that dancers are treated properly and more 
I, I think it's everybody's job to ensure that dancers are treated properly. Um, but I, my question is more about um, in their consideration of the work in the in the labor that's being done to develop the work. What is what is a dramaturge's responsibility to dancers, and how do they consider the dancers? Sure, that's, sorry, there's something there. Yeah. We consider it uh, in, a, in a time spectrum, and I know that we're focusing on uh, the production and rehearsal process and development, but I think it's worth considering um, a dramaturgist critic and how we relate to dancers in that time period, the dramaturgist critic. And a really extreme example that pops to mind, if, if anyone remembers uh, Arlene Croce's response to Bill T. Jones's piece in the 1990s, she wrote a piece called, I think it was in The New Yorker, uh, reviewing the Unreviewable, and Bill T. Jones uh, choreographed, and I think he performed in it as well, a, a piece that was entirely um, danced and performed by uh, HIV-positive dancers. So they, were, they had an embodied knowledge of mortality that they were communicating in their dance. It, their knowledge was absolute in what they were communicating, and she wouldn't review it. She wrote a review about how she wouldn't review it and why it didn't qualify as art as far as she was concerned because these dancers and he as choreographer had not sublimated their knowledge sufficiently. They hadn't processed it to make it bearable for the consumers and for her. And so she rejected their vocabulary of their embodied knowledge and she wouldn't interact with it. And it sparked this debate of responses from all these uh, famous writers and authors and celebrities, um, but the dan the the f I never read anything about the dancers in that process or a response from them or how it that rejection impacted them, their health, their careers. So that and that to me is a dramaturgical issue on her part. What was her responsibility? I mean, I, dramaturgs often become critics, so that's that's a part of the career conversation that we need to have as well. What is our responsibility to the dancers who perform as we critique their performance? This is, or, or, uh, or the possibility of, it seems like you're, you're speaking to the possibility of a dramaturg heading off that kind of criticism with thinking it through. Um, although that's like, that her, her response was like, uh, it, it's hard. It's hard. It, it might be hard to imagine that kind of response when you're an artist and a human being. Um, but yeah, I can see. I think that that seems to be the flip side of what you're suggesting too. Is that right? Well, I don't answer the question for anyone. Yeah, it's just about questions today. No answers. <laughs> only questions. Yeah. It just seems to me like what's coming to mind for me from Amelia's question is that you know, the idea that. As the body is text, if the dramaturg is to care about the text, then in the dance, the body is the text, so the care is there. It seems like really important. But then also, what I've been hearing about the dramaturg is asking questions, so that seems to go down the other path of um, the critic. So, is the question asker or the caretaker? And I think that. that um, Diverged um, split comes up in curation as well. We talked a lot about that. And curation is it to, to care for or is it to ask questions? Or is it caring to ask questions? And when can you when can you weave the two together? Mm -hmm. And how do you weave the two together? Um, do you have a question? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I would. Uh, a couple of things come to mind because it's already been pretty. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of riches here. Um, I, I guess I might say that uh, first I, I I've worked in I haven't really worked in in um, conventional you could say conventional theater context in a long time, but that was my training, and and I've done mostly. Um, work that's interdisciplinary or which is presented in dance contexts for the last 10 years and it's it's been work that more than anything else is uh, working on groups and group process and it's collaborative so um, but that said I, I come from a theater training and a theater background and and so when I'm when Brian started talking about aesthetics I was like 
Well, for me, I think uh, it, in my in my experience, it's possible to substitute that for for text, really. And and the reason why I think working in dance and in relation to dance and and choreography has been the has actually been the most sustaining contact in my practice as a writer is because I think in dance processes we are working most directly with text we're working with the text that mm -hmm. is that we that's in, encoded in us um, that's in, encoded in, in spectatorship um, directly without even without without the imposition of of, uh, of a text coming from a stage and the, and the moment of interpretation and translation that happens. You've got your own text you're already playing when you watch a performance without words. So working as a dramaturg and, and taking up dramaturgical questions in, in say, freak sometimes wordless um, processes seems to be a way of working, yeah, working directly with text. Mm -hmm. So it, I wonder, I, you know, when you say like this is this is like a secret mission to um, to establish the, the the case for a, da a dance dramaturgy conference, I, I I would say maybe it's it's a, also, it could be a case for expanding the presence of conversations about dance dramaturgy in the LMDA um, or or whatever in similar like I, I it, and it's kind of been my hobby horse as a as somebody who's facilitated. Um, curatorial type situations. It's that uh, you know. It's it's so important to to recognize and and work to articulate the practices that are informing the the, the people who are the artists who are making and what they're making. But I feel like uh, that this kind of disciplinary thinking is so unhelpful in presentation. Um, and so how how do you as a curator and possibly as a dramaturg, um, and because I, I think those are quite related tasks. How do you how do you work to how do you activate uh, uh, ideas? How do you activate process through the with the energy of discipline, which is often a negative one, mm -hmm. it, and it's often it's often a traumatic it's often mm -hmm. like traumatic experience that people are moving from and trying to move through, and then create a circle that can. Um, a circle that can receive and hold that. Uh, that's so. I, I don't know if there's a question there. That's that was kind of just. The, I've been reaction. trying to find, trying yeah. to find one. <laughs> that's a reaction. No, it's, there isn't one really. That's just the a reaction. Question, that's the question that's might be Evan. What, what's the shared vocabulary? Because that 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 yeah. seems to be what the struggle so often is when, when in a multidisciplinary environment mm -hmm. or when any different. When, a, when disciplines meet, yeah, yeah. what's the shared vocabulary? Yeah. And I know <clears throat> when I started yeah. working with Cirque, for instance, or yeah. Tisole, that, and I'm coming purely from a theatrical background, mm -hmm. and how do I talk to a trapeze artist, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and just to start to, to rethink how I think, what I think narrative is, mm -hmm. is a hu was a huge door opener mm -hmm. for me, because we're coming from text-based discipline in theater, so we think of, of, of dialogue as, as uh, the vehicle for narrative, spoken narrative. But of course there's physical narrative, there's emotional narrative, there's visual narrative, there's experiential narrative. And, and I know for myself that really helped me just to get at least a baby step in the, in the right direction of, okay, well, what, are, what is our shared vocabulary as opposed to what we often focus on, which is just, well, this is so much different from that, so we have to create a new vocabulary, which, which may be essential, but, but to begin to create that new vocabulary, starting with things that we at least somehow dimly recognize as a, as a shared vo vocabulary. I just offer that as, as, a, uh, as, as a, a, a real door and window opener for me when I started to, to think of narrative in physical terms, visual terms, experiential terms is huge when, certainly when, you're, when you're working with CERC, but um, emotional narrative is huge for me in dance because that's how I experience it. I experience it as an emotional journey that, that, that I, I can, what is my journey in relationship to that piece that I jo just saw. I, I can't articulate it in, in, you know, necessarily in words, but I, but I can feel it. Mm -hmm. I can feel that that was my emotional, the emotional narrative of this piece for me. I, I can re recall it uh, yeah. within my body as an emotion, as an emotional journey. This is this curious thing that I, that I come up <coughs> against, or 
or notice when I work with people who come predominantly from a from a theater background is this desire to encode narrative in what dance is doing, mm -hmm. including, oh, I don't see a text-based narrative, I don't see a temporal narrative, there must be an emotional narrative, sure. something like that. And I don't, I really don't know how to describe that I don't work with narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and of course it, it becomes present and it becomes visual and it becomes visible. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember I gave a talk one time to, to this like emerging theater creators thing and there was a, she was like probably 20 or 21 years old and a, a young playwright and she was asking about my curatorial work and asking if there was a theme and I said no and asking if there was a narrative and I said no and she said well if there's no theme and there's no narrative then how is it a thing? <laughs> I don't know what yeah. to do for it. Yeah. 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 But, but, but I, I think I could reflect back, sorry Mark, but I think I could reflect back part of what I'm when I speak of, let's say, for instance, the emotional narrative, mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily uh, referring to how you're creating it, I'm referring to how I'm experiencing yeah. it. Mm -hmm. and, and that can be a dramaturgical function. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. it, that I can reflect back to how I'm experiencing this, mm -hmm. which may or may not give you some information in terms of however you're creating, mm -hmm. uh, you know, use, use it as you will. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but eventually, whatever you're creating needs an audience. Mm -hmm. And and if I can, if I can let go of, uh, of my uh, subjective perspective uh, and, and try as purely as possible to reflect back to you what I think. It, it, it's, it's for me, it's a healthier, and a, this isn't a, a critique of the word critique, but the, the idea of the critic is I always have a challenge with because it's got such weird connotations. Uh, but the reflecting back, reflecting back to the creator, uh, what 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 the, the effect of their work is in whatever way uh, may be of some, of some dramaturgical uh, benefit as an author. I think that the way that I, I might be able to ask a, a question uh, from that from that um, reflection that I had was was that it seems like maybe finding the moment when a practice becomes a process mm -hmm. is part of what I'm seeking in uh, what I what I. I could, I could articulate my responsibilities as a dramaturg in as much as I am, typically, in that way. Um, and, that's, and that's, I think that task is, somehow contains my belief that, that people are coming out of ways of working and they're, they're formed by ways of working and that, that, those way, that all of the information that creates that way is part of, is, is vital um, and needs to be Respected and also reflected upon and crit critiqued, um, but that for it to really meet to meet the world, we have to it has to be acknowledged. It has to get beyond that. It has to exceed its own informing conditions. So practice and and becoming process is a way of thinking about it that helps me sometimes. But where 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 do you find that, and what are the tools that allow you to find that to to be present in that moment when it turns. That's that's what I'm wondering. So if anyone has any ideas. Uh, yeah. What you were talking about, I just I think I think is so is so smart and so candy. Um, I don't know, for like nine years I was the dramaturg. They got through theater, we did largely classical work, then for twelve years. I was running a playwriting program at Yale. It was all about new plays, new plays, new plays. And uh, not that I was teaching Aristotle, never. Never, never. Uh, but, and then I was very lucky. I spent on and off for five years, and even still now, doing a lot of work with this incredible uh, group of people led by Moises Kaufman, the theater company. And the core of that is this idea of the moment work. That, you know, the starting point is we can't think about behavior in a certain way. We can't look at three sisters and say, okay, this is, you know, this is the way people behave. And this is the that idea of a play is written this way. The starting point for their putting together a stage event, we don't talk about plays, we're talking about stage events, is that and I, I teach this way. It, I talk about you have at your disposal a hundred elements. 
you've got sound, you've got rhythm, you've got emotion, you've got smell, you've got all these things. Uh, you've got an audience. And so when I when I work with my playwrights, I you know I tell them stop stop using that word action. You're being held hostage hostage by actors. This this idea of the you know the, the, what I call the tennis match. You know I'm sending you the action across the you know the thing. Stop thinking that way. Think in terms of pressure. You know the the the, the, the pressure that's building. You know, when you're talking about, I don't think like the narrative, you know, it's a movie, I don't think about the narrative, the, the plot driving me along. There's other things that are happening to you. I don't know what they are. I mean, you as an artist, as you as an artist, know about those. And that's the way I talk about it. The sum of those things build and the pressure drives you forward through space and drives those actors through space, those human beings through space. I don't, I don't talk about plot, I don't talk about action. There are pressure, pressure of the images, things like that in space. And that's what the moment book does, which I think is a healthier way of looking at it. I, I, I appreciate what you're saying about pressure, because when, um, I, I, I don't, I identify as an inter-artist, so I don't have a problem with, um, mixing it or finding a common language with uh, with other artists because I'm I'm quite versatile that way but in any of my experiences like um, in theater dance and visual art I've trained classically and formally in all of them and whenever I was in one it was like you guys need to understand what's understood in the other one and and the experience goes on um, and on but but the baseline is the corporal it's the body, and that's what when you described you've got all these things, sound, emotion, you're describing all experiences of um, the body, and they're sensory, sensory, absolutely, and they're almost, um, you can't put them to words, but then sometimes all we have is words, especially speaking again to, um, there's a lot of wisdom here with the experience of the, the visually impaired, because it, it's still, it is the, the one thing that's connecting all of us is your body. You can write me paragraphs on the experience of cutting your arm, but nothing is going to compare to the experience of cutting your arm, the flow of drugs from the hypothalamus and the feeling of danger in the body. Absolutely. So if that was the, the moment you were trying to communicate or, or um, trying to assist with as a, as a dramaturg, the the research needs to happen in the body, and uh, that's not taught. Um, and I'm not sure what moving forward in that way would look like, because we, we do have a problem with the written word. Only certain things are written. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working with my community in the north, where there's just a couple of us scattered um, in the same area, the Provincial Park, if you're aware of that. It's one of the jewel park systems. It, um, was a big site for the group of seven. It, it actively erased us. Um, they burnt out our hunt camps. They did all sorts of things. So as we're trying to consolidate the area currently with a small working group of 40 Nishnas up there, there is no written word. We've only got um, our embodied knowledge of the land and oral tradition. And you, you come up with this thing where the thing needs to be printed to exist. Bill T. Jones's experience needs to be written about to have existed. I did, like some of the proudest things I've done in my career, people don't write about. Like I did earlier this year, a uh, Ngozi Wanong Rite of Spring, like a Rite of Spring project in Peterborough on a parking lot um, that's a burial ground and it had 40 community members, um, like a three-year-old to an 80-year-old and every age in between, nobody wrote about it because nobody wants to touch that, right? Um, and that experience will only exist in, in the people who can carry that forward and the, and the physical um, research that is the thing that is connecting um, all of us. The one thing I'd, I'd say, like a, a huge problem with um, um, audio, um, I'm losing my words, um, audio assistance when you're watching um, a play I've, I've found. I, I'm trying to get a lot of my works audio described. 
So the practice of audio describing is trying to be totally neutral. Yeah. <laughs> and it's that you can't actually describe what I'm doing physically as totally uh, from a neutral place, that there has to be um, the presence of, of, of this pressurized talk um, to, to convey the, um, the experience. So it's in, it's in that in-between place that I think you would see the presence of, of physical dramaturgy come out more in, in the theater. That's so interesting. Um, just talk about the audio described because what ASL has done in terms of creating um, variation, oh, translations of works on stage, when you're watching an ASL interpreter, they are not doing a line by line. This, you know, they have someone who's a director who's watching and making sure that the signs that they're using are doing storytelling and telling a story. And it might actually shift from what's actually on stage because it is going to be subjective based on whoever is designing those signs. Um, and the idea that audio interpretation doesn't do that is very interesting to me. And I'm like, now I'm like, maybe there's a market for that. Um, but yeah, that's, it's fascinating. I think. You know, when we talk about the dramaturg, the dance dramaturg as the person who's helping the artist create, or the dance dramaturg as the person who's being a set of reflective audience eyes, um, or who's providing context for the audience, and I think those are three separate roles. Um, and I guess a question that I have. Uh, for choreographers and for dancers is how much they're thinking about the audience experience of what they're doing or how much it's about the physical experience of making it, which goes, I think, back also to an aesthetic question, uh, because I think those would require um, different types of care and assistance and thought. Oh, that, that's the dance tendency is to not think enough about the audience and the theater tendency is to think too much about the audience. <laughs> it's like... Um, so we have about five minutes left. Um, so what I was going to propose is uh, if everybody in conclusion can offer a question, not one that we're going to answer now, but offer a question, uh, either that you came in with that wasn't answered <laughs> or that's based on what's happened today. Uh, so that's, with five minutes left, that means that we have uh, about 15 seconds per person uh, to do that. So uh, we don't have to do it in a circular order. Uh, if you know what your question is, you can just uh, say it, but I just want to make sure. It's fascinating, but how you audio uh, what's I know I've lost audio the describe. Uh, audio describe a dance piece. I, I'm, that's my question. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? I'm interested in more. I'm sorry about asking this, this question of um, um, with someone with a visual impairment. Like, how do you experience the work, and how can we translate the work out? I, I think it's an amazing question. And then, yeah. Yes, my question is about structure versus narrative and if they're the same thing when it comes to um, visual works, visual performance. My question is whether the presence of text implies narrative any more than movement implies action. Mm -hmm. I think my question um, is kind of sitting in between being a musician and uh, also doing craniosacral therapy, I'm thinking about the fact that we, we are entities floating, but we are solid as well. So within art, this, this energy goes through us, whether we can hear it, feel it, smell it. But at the same time, I'm just posing the question, what if within a performance we, as little kids, whenever they see anyone showing something, they mimic? My question is, why don't I just teach you how to release the pain in your body from the stage as you do it with me? So that's my offering. 
How does the daily world narrative out there affect your narrative as a dancer? I have two questions, very quick. Um, only one, only one. Only one. No, just two. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <coughs> as someone who's trained as a dancer, coming to dramaturgy as a dancer, how do we, uh, I don't want to say educate, but how do we help audience understand dance in a non-text way, even though we are based around text and digital media? And how, why is it so difficult for them to understand a visual language if all we do is live in a society based around the visual? Mm -hmm. Second question, um, and I'm struggling with this. How do we as dramaturgs, what's the best way to advertise ourselves to dance companies um, in a way that doesn't seem that we are just the critic sitting in the room or to make it seem like we want to be um, artists as assistant choreographers? My question is, is it imperative to understand something? <laughs> that can be the title, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think every time I watch that, I like that, but I don't think I understood it. Every you time don't I have to under, I don't understand. Yeah, I don't understand it, and it's not, not necessary. Yeah, that's why that it makes it like poetry. poetry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My question is around kinesthetic understanding and how we can embolden uh, dramaturgs to um, be embodied and participate in choreographic work. My question is actually very related to what, what your question was. Is how can I better be in my body as, you know, for a kinesthetic response to the work that's being uh, put in rehearsal on stage? How can I do that? I think my question would be, um, is there, is, is there, um, is, is the experience, from, from an audience perspective, is the experience of, um, of dance and, and non-text theater, um, like, inherent, does that include, like, an inherently normative sensory experience? I don't know if I'm phrasing that correctly. that I always like to ask dramaturgs who are interested in dance, and that's, how do you play with gravity? Or how do you understand gravity? I would ask what structures and practical tools support an articulation of the baseline collective dramaturgy that is always happening in process, and um, allow it to be more present and stronger in work. I have a question for the people in the room who said something to this effect. As a, as a dance teacher of dance, a contemporary dance for adults with no background in dance, why do you consider yourself not to be embodied or to not be in your body? Yeah, I'm not I'm not looking for answers to me personally because I know it's a personal question, but uh, it's a I teach a lot of adults who don't have a dance background and I wonder and a lot of people say I don't think I'm in my body and I wonder I wonder about that question. I, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, something that I'm curious about is as somebody who trained in a highly uh, text-based, classically oriented theater program and then immediately started working in, in dance uh, since then and have not really been around text-based theater for a long time, um, is, is, there, is there anything that we know as practitioners working in the dance field that, uh, that uh, the theater can steal from us? Uh, and in reverse, is there anything that we can steal from the, the theater? Um, and then how can we set up environments for that knowledge to be uh, exchanged? I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Solid. Put that one on the description. Is there anything else? 
so shall we close? Once. <laughs> Actually, there she goes. <laughs> He's an auctioneer. Okay, it's something about dra internal dramaturgy and how that relates to aesthetic. Like if I'm following, um, um, I'm following my own internal dramaturgy and how does that relate to aesthetic? Mm. Reading there. Can you read that as it just what occurs is the aesthetic or is there something else that dramaturgically people feel like there's some other layer uh, that needs to be there beyond what I do is the aesthetic when I'm following my own internal dramaturgy. Hmm. 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 What I do is the aesthetic. Um, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.